Hello friends, welcome to Smart Catalyst. Today we'll be seeing the current affairs of 3rd December 2018. The topics we'll be seeing for prelims are these five. First one is about the United Nations Environment's Global Emission Gap Report. The second article is about the tariff war ongoing between US and China and their agreement to hold off fresh tariff for 90 days. Third article is about India-US Air Force joint exercise. Fourth one is about India and China's local currency swap agreement. And the final article is about sharing outbreak data with respect to creating a genetic bank. Apart from these five articles, we are also covering some of the important articles in the form of MCQs. We have attached a PDF in the description given below. The first article we'll be seeing is, Nations must triple efforts to reach 2 degree target. This article was taken from the newspaper, The New Indian Express. So, United Nations Environment has released a new report called as Emission Gap Report 2018. And this report provides significant inputs about the overall rise in the greenhouse gases globally and the effects it will have on the environment. So, this flagship report of United Nations Environment Program has been released ahead of the COP24 of United Nations Framework on Climate Change. This year, COP24, that is Conference of Party 24 of UNFCCC, will be held in a place called as Katowice in Poland. And this COP24 is very significant in the environmental history as it is expected to provide a framework to achieve the COP21 Paris Sustainable Development Targets. So, according to this emission gap report, it states that in order to achieve the ambitious goals of by 2020, the IPCC outlined the goal of keeping the global temperatures below 2 degree and if possible below 1.5 degree, certain multidimensional consistent efforts are needed. However, because of lack of consistent efforts, especially with many developed countries like USA pulling out of the Paris record, coherent global efforts is immediately needed in order to achieve the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. The same concept has also been emphasized on 2018 special report released by IPCC. So these are some of the highlights of the emission gap report. So we all know that after Paris COP21, many countries, many developing countries have contributed to what is called as intended nationally determined contributions. So India has also announced its intended nationally determined contributions. Okay. According to it, it aims to cut down its carbon emissions by 33% to 35% by 2030 or from the levels of carbon emission in the year 2005. So, however, according to a report, this states that only 57 countries which announced its nationally determined responsibilities are on track to achieve what it said so by the year 2030. Adding to this, the Global Emission Report also said that the emissions have reached a historic high of 53 gigatons equivalent of carbon dioxide and it also shows no signs of peaking. Only if the carbon emissions peaks, then the reduction in carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere is possible. Since there is no signs of peaking of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it indicates the current phase of national action is highly insufficient in order to meet the COP21, that is Paris targets. So what must be done in order to achieve the ambitious targets and thus reduce the emission gap? So number one is... The nations must raise their targets of intended nationally determined contributions by at least three times in order to achieve 2 degrees Celsius limit and they must also raise their target by five times in order to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. All these targets emphasize that all the governments of independent nations must act in a faster way with greater urgency in order to protect the environment. The second article we'll be seeing is US-China desire to hold off fresh tariffs for 90 days. This article was taken from the newspaper Hindu. We all know about the ongoing trade wars which got manifested in the form of tariff wars between two main countries, China on one hand and US on other. 
This tariff war is basically due to the increasing ideology of protectionism on one side and increasing globalization on the other side. Uh, this tariff war escalated to significant level in the March of this year with US imposing 25% tariff on the steel imports from China which was accompanied by retaliatory tariff by China which imposed 15% tariff on the American goods especially perishable goods such as fruits, nuts and wine. This tariff war caused a significant disruption of trade all over the world. So in the light of this, in the recent meet of the Chinese and the US leaders in the midst of G20 summit, they have agreed to halt the additional tariffs which will prevent the trade war from escalating for 90 days. The border leaders have agreed to keep down the tariffs by 10% and China has also decided to increase its exports by very substantial level from the country of US. So new trade talks have also been initiated in issues involving technology transfer, intellectual property, non-tariff barriers as well as agriculture. The third article we'll be seeing is India-US Air Forces to begin joint drill on December 3. So this article was also taken from the newspaper Hindu. With the increasing security threats from multiple dimensions, the military exercises between two countries are a very important channel to increase the bilateral relations. In this dimension, India and US Air Force, they begin to conduct a joint drill called as Exercise Scope India 2018. This 12-day military exercise will be conducted in the air base of West Bengal. So it will be conducted in two places, namely Kalaikunda and Panagar air bases. And it must also be noted that this Exercise Scope India is fourth in its edition. So what is the aim of this exercise? The aim of the first important aim of the exercise is to increase the operational coordination. In case of any disaster or any security threat, the operational coordination is one important area which is needed in order to carry out joint efforts. This Scope India is aims to enhance the operational cooperation and also the exposure to undertake mutual exchanges with the global level best practices. This exercise also plans to deepen the defense as well as security ties between the two countries of India and USA. From the side of Indian Air Force, the air fleets which will be participating in the exercise include Suki 30, Jaguar, Mirage as well as other aircrafts from Indian Air Force. The fourth article we'll be seeing is China has announced that it will not conduct any local currency trade with India. This article was also taken from the newspaper Hindu. Recently, India has made a proposal to China. So the proposal was about to carry bilateral trade with local currencies, that is Indian currency of rupee with Chinese currency of renminbi. What is the main intention of this proposal? So we all know that India's trade deficit with China is very, very high. When compared to other BRICS nations such as Brazil, South Africa as well as Russia, we have a whooping high trade deficit with respect to China. According to the data provided and Ministry of Commerce Government of India, India imports almost 60 billion US dollars worth goods from China, whereas it exports only about 11 billion dollar US goods. So there is a deficit of about 50 billion with respect to China. So in order to bridge this ballooning trade deficit and also to boost the exports from India to China, India has proposed a currency swap agreement in order to avoid the usage of the dollar, thus providing a mechanism to avoid the global currency risks. The current situation poses increasing currency risks because of increasing volatility. So this volatility has been caused by many factors including the trade wars or escalating the prices of oils because of US opting out of joint comprehensive plan of action as well as increasing security threat in the area of South China Sea. However, China has declined to accept this proposal of India. Currently, the area of exports from India to China includes few items like pharmaceutical, engineering and services. And China has recently also permitted the exports of rice and sugar from India. The fifth article we'll be seeing is sharing outbreak data. This article was also taken from the newspaper Hindu. So we all know about the recent outbreak of disease called as Zika in the states of Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. 
However, what is to be noted here is that the Indian authorities did not share any health related data so that the spread of disease could have been mitigated in other states as well. So, Indian Council of Medical Research of India, they conducted research and developed a genetically sequenced Zika virus. So, this genetically sequenced Zika virus has been conducted from patients of five states including Rajasthan. However, the Indian Council of Medical Research did not publish the data in open access platform or a database such as GenBank. So, even WHO has emphasized the importance of creating a database bank or a GenBank. Only if there is a GenBank, the government can estimate the number of patients who are affected by the disease and thereby providing sufficient health care in order to address the demand. And this gen bank can also help the state to track the welfare professionals thereby regulating their licensing. Such proposed gen bank will also use the technology as tool which will in, in turn have manifestations in creating a clear cut public welfare policy plan. Such a welfare policy plan will increase the transparency of health delivery in India and will also help India in achieving its target of universal health care. The WHO that is World Health Organization's aim of achieving affordable, timely as well as quality health care to all can be achieved only when there is proper channel for data. And for that, every country must create its own individual genetic bank which must be linked globally in order to provide universal global health care. The articles we'll be seeing for mains are these three. First one is about job creation at farmer's doorstep. This article talks about ways to elevate the farmer's income and thus avoid the rural distress in India. Second article talks about the dysfunctions of India's maternity benefit laws. And the final article talks about coal as a leading source of global energy and it also talks about alternative sources of energy which needs to be inculcated, which needs to be bought in in the global energy mix. The first article we'll be seeing is job creation at farmer's doorstep. This article was also taken from the newspaper Hindu. So recently the government of Andhra Pradesh has bought in a new scheme to support farmers called as Ritu Bandhu scheme. So what is the speciality of this scheme? So the main purpose of this scheme is by providing cash transfer to assist the land owning farmers with non-agricultural income. So it basically provides cash transfers in order to increase the income levels of farmers via increasing their non-agricultural income. The main two dimensions of this scheme are it proposes inputs such as seeds and pesticides and it also transfers 8000 rupees per acre for every land owning farmers in both the crop seasons that is both in Karif as well as Rabi crop seasons. So this state scheme it goes against a traditional policy of providing price interventions or by providing trade restrictions. or by the new common way of farm waivers. However, this program also has its inherent problem. The major problem is the inbuilt bias towards large farmers. According to the state data, the beneficiaries of this scheme will be large farmers who have land holdings of more than 5 acres. Almost 9% of these large farmers, they received 35% of the total benefits of this scheme. So, this calls for serious look into the schemes which are directed towards increasing farmers income. Other central level schemes proposed to increase the farmers income are ENAM that is creating a universal agricultural market for farmers, soil health cards in order to preserve the health of the soil thereby increasing the farmers income. Third one is increasing the area under irrigation by providing micro irrigation facilities to farmers. And the final one is doubling the farmer's income by 2022, which also has a part of increasing 1.5 times the MSP. So let's now assess the level of rural distress in India. A proper way to assess any economic situation is by availability of proper data. 
and here the data comes from All India Rural Financial Inclusion Survey. This survey is conducted by the institution of NABARD. According to this survey of NABARD, it is shown that the agricultural households, they receive only 43% of their total income from the agriculture. This shows that about 57% of their income comes from non-agricultural sources, though they are predominantly investing in agriculture. The survey also adds that most of the sources of agricultural income, they comes from daily wage labor as well as government job in the form of MNREGA. On a whole, the agricultural households when compared to non-agricultural households, they have higher debt which in turn pushes them into debt trap. And this is also one of the reasons for increasing farmers suicides in India. The government has proposed to double the farmers income by the year of 2022 by raising the minimum support prices to 1.5 times. However, such incentives will apply only to 48% of rural India according to this survey, whereas the major chunk of rural India will remain unaffected. However, major chunk of uh, rural India, that is the households who are participating in non-agricultural activities will be left behind. So, this doubling farmers income cannot be proposed as a scheme in order to remove the rural distress in India. The author also says that increasing rural distress has also increased the rural urban gap with rural economy lagging behind the urban economy in terms of growth. Apart from empowering the landless labourers as well as marginal farmers, additional income support is needed. So this additional income support can be bought in by diversification. The first sector which needs to be concentrated to increase the agricultural income is the livestock sector. Currently, India has a national breeding policy. However, the current breeding policy, it focuses only on exotic breeds and also by other technological process of artificial insemination. So, this policy must be redirected based on best performing indigenous breeds in order to provide alternative income to the farmers. The role of state government also becomes important. The role of state, the state governments must be encouraged to build their indigenous breeds as well as they must also be encouraged to increase the R&D in the livestock sector. Building a geographical information system using technology can also be a successful step in order to diversify the farmer's income. This must also be supported with increasing private investment especially in animal health care. This animal health care must also include preventive health care such as vaccinations in order to avoid any epidemic situations. All these calls for harmonizing rules, regulations as well as regulatory authorities across all states in order to create a uniform system. The second area which needs to be concentrated is the focus on the migrant workers. We all know about the increasing migration from the underdeveloping states to the developing states and this migration is mainly to the construction sector. In order to address the problem of the migrant workers, a multi-prolonged step is needed. And this multi-prolonged step must concentrate on all these areas. First one is the access of the government schemes, both central as well as state, to the migrant labourers. The main problem suffered by the migrant labourers is the lack of identity proof. Though this problem has been partially solved with the incoming of Aadhaar, many migrant workers still continue to suffer from lack of identity and because of that, they are not even able to access basic healthcare facilities provided by the Anganwadi centres. In the absence of basic healthcare facilities, the women migrant labourers become the main affected people. They are also unable to access the crush facilities, especially in the construction site. Different states have different laws in order to regulate the migrant population and also to provide them with various security benefits. However, the non-compliance with this law is very high and the penalties for this law is very low. Both of this must be changed in order to protect the migrant workers. The second one is, most of the migrant workers, they are not registered with the welfare board of the state. So, registration of the workers with the welfare board must be made mandatory 
so that this responsibility on the contractor and the builder thus reinforcing the security benefits on the migrant labor force. And there is also a concept called as construction sex. This construction sex is a sex between one person to two person which is levied on the cost of construction by the central government. So this sex is levied based on an act called as building and other construction workers welfare sex act of 1966. The utilization of this, this cess collected has to be improved in order to protect the workers mainly from the construction sector. So all these shows the need for creating a sustainable long term rural non form sources of employment which can aid the rural poor in overcoming the barriers of economy and thus translating it into economic prosperity. These rural policies must also end the rural to urban migration by building sufficient infrastructure, market access and institutions in order to develop an inclusively developed India. The next article we will be seeing is India's maternity laws need serious tweaking. This article was taken from the newspaper Mint. So we all know about the changes that the government has brought into Maternity Benefit Act of 1961. So this bill has brought in significant changes from increasing the 12 weeks maternity leave to 26 weeks. The application of this bill was extended to all the establishments which had more than 10 employees and it also called for establishment of crash facilities to all the establishments which has more than 50 employees in order to provide efficient child care facilities. However, the inherent dysfunctions in the bill has led to lower levels of employers hiring women. A recent research has been conducted by Team Lease based on the amendments for this bill and this study shows significant insights on the limitations of the bill. So one of the major problem in Indian Maternity Benefit Act is the share of the financial burden. According to the Maternity Benefit Act of 2017, the financial compensation to the maternity leave of 26 weeks must be fully borne by the employer. However, this is against the global practice of cost sharing between employer, government as well as other agency in case of many developed nations such as Singapore. This is the major reason for employers not willing to hire more women into their companies. So this dysfunction can be corrected by setting up a government insurance scheme to pay for the maternity of wages thus compensating the wage loss partially for the employers. Another significant change which can be done to mitigate this financial burden is via the process of leave sharing. The concept of paternity leave is very common in many developed countries in Europe. This concept of paternity leave that is providing leave for men by for becoming fathers can be brought into India also. By providing a leave sharing of 13 months for women as well as 13 months for men, it can be possibly able to negate the gender bias. Another important dysfunction of this act of 2017 is a female worker has to be part of employers provident fund organization that is EPFO in order to access the government seven week reimbursement. So if a woman employer is not a part of EPFO at least for one year, she will not be covered under this reimbursement scheme of the government. So adding to this is the provisions relating to setting up of crashes. The policy states that setting up of crashes is mandatory. However, there is no specific guidelines regarding the issues of prerequisites like caretakers, visits my mothers and the location of the crashes in the bill. So these two issues must be addressed in order to remove the gender bias which is inherently present in Indian society. Only by removing these dysfunctions, India's overall female labor force participation can be increased from its current 26% which is very very less than competitive global levels of 60% prevailing in China. And addressing gender bias is also very much important in order for India to achieve its sustainable development goal target of 5 which stresses the importance of gender equality.
The final article of the day is Coal is a junk food of global energy. This article was taken from the newspaper Mint. So let's see the energy mix of India. The energy mix shows the sources of energy with respect to different forms. In India, fossil fuels it contributes 70% of the energy use, whereas However, other renewable sources of energy, they contribute only 18% of the total energy mix. So, in the recent increasing awareness and the stress laid by the climate change, increasing the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix becomes very much important to mitigate the harmful effects. So, recently, International Energy Agency released its World Energy Outlook. So, according to the report, it shows that India is one of the few countries with high percentage of coal use. So, together India and China, they use 432 gigawatts of total coal-fired energy. Even developed countries such as Australia, they are rich, they are still dependent on coal. Another important observation made by the Outlook report is, higher income countries tend to be less energy intensive and use less coal, especially countries of European Union. However, the developing countries such as India and China, they tend to be more energy intensive and they more depend on the sources such as coal. So, this situation raises seriously concern, especially in the light of to be conducted COP24 in Poland.